Good evening and welcome to Discover the Joy. I'm Paul Hurley and we're so very thankful that you're letting us be a part of your life tonight. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 35. Luke chapter 23, verse 35. That's where Mom's going to be teaching from in just a minute. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to call that number that you'll see on the bottom of the screen and we'll send you a Bible that looks a lot like this one right here. It's a very nice Bible. It's got a map and uh, it's a, it's, it's, there's no substitute for the Word of God, and we'd love to send you a Bible. So if you, uh, if you uh, need one, just call that number at the bottom of the screen that you'll see throughout the show, and the same number is for prayer. Now listen to Mom. We are so glad to be back with you tonight, and this is the beginning of, of a brand new year, uh, 2014. And, you know, I don't know what 2013 uh, was like for for all of you. I know that there has been ups and downs because that's life. Uh, I also know with our country as it is that um, this is not the same America that I knew when I was growing up and even as my children uh, that were that they were growing up. So uh, if you've ever been saved and perhaps you've been away from the Lord, it's time for you to come back to the Lord and to get into his word and to study because I believe he's coming soon. I believe his word teaches that he's coming soon. If you've never been saved, I wouldn't, I would not put it off one more minute because none of us have the assurance of tomorrow. But what I do know is, as a believer, as a saved person, I do not know what this new year holds. I don't even know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds tomorrow. And a great preacher, Adrian Rogers, used to say, whatever is beyond you or above you, something that you cannot grasp, you cannot get a handle on it, it is beneath the Lord Jesus Christ. You just stop and think about that. Whatever is above us, whatever we cannot grasp, is still beneath the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if, we've, if you've ever needed to be close to the Lord, I believe now is the time that we need to be close to the Lord. We've always needed to be close to the Lord, but I believe that time is as we know it here on this earth is running out and the time that's left is going to become harder and harder and I think that if you turn on any news channel you can see that. But before we begin our lesson tonight and I would love as Paul mentioned uh, that if you cannot afford a Bible we give free Bibles that's part of the ministry. If you also notice we never ask for money and uh, it's not that we're running over with money no one that me or anybody that uh, operates the equipment or anything, uh, none of us receive a salary. It's, we do this for only one reason and one reason only, and that is for the honor and glory of God. And God's word said, Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And that is our sole mission, our sole purpose, is to lift Jesus Christ up to point you to the eternal word of God and that you might truly experience joy. Let's go to the Lord as we start our lesson tonight. Father, we just thank you that we have the privilege to come into the throne room of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, I thank you that your word is eternal. Father, we will never take anything into heaven, into the very presence of a holy God with us except what we have hid in our hearts, our souls, our minds about the Word of God, what you, because your Word will stand forever. And Father, also those, the souls that we've witnessed to and those that have been saved because of some small thing that we've done to point them to Jesus Christ. Father, tonight I pray for an anointing of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus Christ be lifted up. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Last week we, <clears throat> we know uh, in Luke chapter 23, I hope if you don't have your Bible there in your lap, you'll run get it. 
and uh, nothing nothing is will ever substitute for you putting your eyes on the Word of God and you can be deceived there are people on te television on television ministries on the radio in certain churches uh, that do not teach and preach the entirety of the Word of God we believe at Discover the Joy TV ministry that this word is holy because it has been anointed, it has come from God. God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired the men that wrote the 66 books of his word. Not only that, it is going to stand forever. People have tried to burn it. They've tried to uh, uh, destroy it in many, many ways. And the word of God will live on forever and ever, just as we will. Our souls, our spirit will live in one of two places, that's heaven or hell. No one makes that choice except you yourself. People want to say all the time, I get a lot of, why would, why would a loving, holy God send anyone to hell? Because they have trampled the blood of Jesus Christ. They go to hell by their own choice. They choose where they're going to spend eternity. I made that choice years and years ago. Actually, I was a little girl of six years old, and I was blessed to be in a home where my parents were Christians, and they taught us from early on that Jesus Christ was, uh, <clears throat> is the only way to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, Good works is not going to get you to heaven. We're going to see that tonight as we study. Uh, good works should be something that someone that's been born again, someone that believes that Jesus Christ paid their sin debt at Calvary, you become a born again believer. Yes, you should have good works. That should be part of what comes forth from God Almighty and the Holy Spirit living within you. It, there should be fruit of what's taking place on the inside. But thinking that you can work and do things that's going to be good enough to get you in heaven, it's not, that's not going to happen. If you do not accept, there's going to be two judgments. The great white throne judgment and everyone that has rejected Jesus Christ in this life will have to stand at the great white throne judgment. And you are going to be, you are going to be judged and you may say you don't <clears throat> believe in the word of God, but that God himself, Jesus Christ, will judge you by the 66 books. And it won't be your sin of murder, your sin of homosexuality, the sin of lying, the sin of stealing, the sin of perversion, how, whatever you want to put there, it, that's not going to be what sends you to hell. The reason anyone will be in hell is because they trampled the blood of Jesus Christ to get there. They refused to believe because sin was paid for at Calvary. Jesus Christ did that. And good works, fasting, giving, which is, all of that should, it can be good if it's done in the right way, in, in the, uh, the right means. But it's not what will get you to heaven. It's the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did for you at Calvary is the only way you're going to get to heaven. And friend, I said earlier, I'm going to say it again, we do not have a lot of time left. And with the days that I see coming ahead, you better know what you believe and whom you believe in. Now, <clears throat> Last week we finished with Jesus. He's already hanging on the cross and there's the two criminals on either side of him. And his is the cross in the middle. That day at Calvary, some, of, uh, some translations call it Golgotha. Uh, Golgotha meaning the skull. It was a small hill and there was three, three uh, crosses that day. Two men were criminals. They deserved to die. And the, the man in the center, 
God Almighty, through his son Jesus Christ, had taken on humanity to come to this earth for one reason and one reason only, and that was to pay for my sin debt and your sin debt. See, you can read any part in the Bible, uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, God so loved Sandy, God so loved John, God so loved Paul. Whatever you want to, whatever your name is, you put it there. Because when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he looked down through eternity and he saw you. And some people say, well, there's some that have been chosen to be saved and there's some that have no. The, any, any choosing is all on your part. It's not on God's part. God being all knowing knows who's going to accept Jesus Christ and who will reject him. But it's still your choice. It's still your choice. And <clears throat> we dealt with the part in verse 34 last week where Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And actually, he was practicing. So, you know, it's easy to teach or preach, but he was practicing what he had taught his disciples because we said last week in chapter 6 of Luke, uh, verse 29, he taught his disciples about forgiving. And he said, you forgive those who have done something against you. How, uh, how, how, why would we be patted on the back to love someone who's doing good for us, who's easy to love? Jesus loved us when we were unlovable, when we were covered with sin. Jesus loved us. And so he's asking there on the cross, Father, you forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. He was not only a speaking of the soldiers and the others standing at the foot of the cross. He was talking about Pilate. He was talking about Herod. He was talking about me. And he was talking about you. But see, the people at the foot of the cross that day, they did not have the full canon of Scripture. We do. There will never, ever be another book added to the holy word of God. It's more than enough. When, he, <clears throat> when the book of Revelation was finished, it says, Lord Jesus, come quickly. That was it. Nothing else needs to be added to it. Now, man has added to God's word, and that is a dangerous situation to be in because when you add to or you take away from the word of God, you're playing with someone's eternity. And I don't want to have to stand before God with the blood of someone on my hands. And if you are a believer and you're not living like a believer, listen, Jesus doesn't have a secret service. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you need to be living like you believe in Jesus Christ because you do not know whose life you're going to impact by the way that you treat them, by the way that you revere a holy God. Then we find in verse 35, there was three groups of people at the foot of the cross that day. It says the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him, speaking of Jesus. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And then in verse 36, the soldiers also came up and they mocked him. All right, the three groups that we see <clears throat> on that bleak afternoon at Calvary are pretty much three groups of people that you can look around in America or, or any place in the world when it comes to Jesus Christ and there's still these groups and this is how they reacted to Jesus. We find that the Jewish leaders scoffed or sneered at him. This was the religious leaders. They didn't believe he was the son of God. I've told you before, I hope you, if you, you I'm going to keep saying it till I hope you, it, it becomes burned in your mind. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with the living God. Praise God. It's a relationship. And it's not just a formality or something that we go through. So, no, don't, don't accuse me of being religious. But I am glad for you to, to accuse me of being in, in a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. Amen to that. 
And the people stood and watched. They were like indifferent. They just stood and watched what was taking place. And then the soldiers, they mocked him. I said there were three groups of people. There were those who watched the religious leaders who uh, they just scoffed, made fun of, like you say you're, you're the son of God. And then the soldiers mocked him. Today, we are encountering the very same thing. There are those people who are so indifferent. They're just aloof to anything about a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't want to get involved. They want to be politically correct. I was so uh, put out. I was listening to a uh, news channel the other night. And, of course, we just come out of the Christmas season. And a news reporter had gone out on the sidewalk of New York City and with a microphone and the TV camera and he was at, he asked everybody the same question. He, they, he said, during this season, do you say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays? And he'd put the microphone under somebody's face, uh, mouth. Most of them said, oh, well, I'll say Happy Holidays because I don't want to offend anybody. A few said that they would say Merry Christmas because they had always said Merry Christmas. How about saying that the reason for Christmas is Christ? How do you spell Christmas? C-H-R-I-S-T, Christ. Uh, <clears throat> but most people said, well, if I'm talking to my family because we were used to saying Merry Christmas, I'll say Merry Christmas. But if I'm talking to a stranger, I'll say Happy Holidays because I don't want to offend them. I'm going to tell you, I'd rather offend someone and tell them the truth about Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, he is the way to heaven, then like I said earlier, have to stand with their blood on my hands. And, I'm, and, and this nation has come to the point where we have to be politically correct. I'm going to tell you, when we get before the judgment seat of Christ or either the white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, or for those who have believed, we're not judged on our salvation. We will be judged for what we've done with this book and the time that Jesus Christ and God has given us here on earth. If you're at the white throne judgment, you're on your way to hell because there's no more opportunity at that point to accept Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm going to renege I was wrong. Uh-uh, not then you won't. You were given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. So we've got people today, they scoff at Jesus, they mock Jesus, or they're just so indifferent, they just watch and say, I don't really want to get involved because people seem, people seem to really get angry when we mention the name Jesus. Stop and think about that. Why, why in this world... Does the name Jesus Christ bring, so much, bring about so much uh, antagonism? Why? If, there's nothing, if you believe there's nothing to him, why would it bother you? Because you can't get around it. You cannot get around Jesus. You will deal with Jesus before you live, leave this life. You will either say yes to Jesus or no. So then we find out where he said uh, uh, the soldiers came up and they mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar. And they said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And right before that, some of the rulers, the religious rulers, said, he saved others, so let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And... When they said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. You know what's really ironic about that is? Jesus Christ, at any point, could have said, Father, I'm not going to do it. And he could have come down off of that cross. Or he could have called 10,000 angels 
at that point. But he proved that he was the Son of God and that he loved all of mankind because he stayed on the cross and he paid my sin debt and he paid your sin debt. And uh, then we see that uh, there was also a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. And this was just another jab to make fun of uh, Jesus Christ. They, the, when the sign was, when, when uh, Pilate had the sign made, he said, it is what it is. Uh, see, they didn't want to believe that he was the king of the Jews because he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. He wasn't becoming uh, an earthly king at that point. He didn't free them from Roman rule. So uh, they decided, okay, this could not be the Messiah because he doesn't look like what I want him to. He's not doing what I want him to. And so I will reject him. And now today people say, well, that's just a figment of your imagination. Oh, if that's so, let me tell you, I will hold on to that till my dying breath because I have experienced salvation. I have experienced the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I know what it is for God to take. I didn't ask to do this. God laid it on my heart and on others' heart that this be done right now. You see, you think you're in control? No, you're not. God is the one that's in total control. He gives us a free will, and men have made wrong, bad choices, and they're being made, by, not daily, but by the minute as we speak but it doesn't change the fact that God is God. He's a living God. He is the only God that others, been a lot of gods, Muhammad and a lot of them that people have said that they worship, but you can go and find that where they're buried today. When you go to Jerusalem at the garden there, there's an empty tomb today because Jesus Christ lives. In fact, how ironic it was when they said, let him save himself. You know, that came back on them. I imagine that rang in their minds, in their ears for the rest of their lives because on the third day, he did. He came back. He came out of that grave. He lives today. He walked among them, and he is in heaven today, seated at the right hand of uh, God, the Father. So when they said, well, if, if, if he is uh, the chosen one, if he is the Son of God, let him save himself. He did, three days later. And then one of the cr criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Well, save yourself and us. Remember, there's two criminals, one on each side of him. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly. This man actually was honest. He took, uh, he, he owned up to what he had done. He said, yeah, I'm guilty. And he said, and I know something else, you're guilty. But he says, uh, we're being punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will, you will be with me in paradise. Uh, you know, it's hard to understand. There's two criminals. They're both guilty. Jesus Christ is in the center. One believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he asks him to, t to be... To, to give him eternal life. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus promised that he did. The other, the other criminal, he's hanging there. He sees the same Jesus. He hears the same words when Jesus asked uh, God the Father to forgive those who were persecuting him, 
killing him, and yet one accepts Jesus, one rejects. I was having this conversation actually earlier tonight with someone, and we were talking about that. How And there's families like that. There's, there's children raised in the same home. Some, if the parents are Christian, some will accept, some will reject. What is the difference? Why do some accept and some reject? It's the free will that God gives us. Some people are willing to believe, and some people are determined not to believe. But I love it when Jesus says in verse 43, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. This was the darkest hour of history right here at this point, and everything seemed lost to uh, the followers, the closest followers of Jesus, but yet at the very, just before the thief died, just before the criminal died, he accepted Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it's never too late to accept Jesus Christ. He will accept you anytime you call on him. He loves you. The Holy Spirit woos you, <clears throat> draws you to Jesus Christ. See, Jesus was the Messiah. There was something very, very godly about him that that thief or that criminal uh, he caught it. He wanted to catch it. He wanted to believe. He did believe, and he was given eternal life. So see, sometimes at the darkest hours, there can be great opportunities that seem to be disguised in impossible situations. I was thinking the other day of Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy, Back during World War II, they were from Holland. They hid Jews. They were put in prison for that. And they were taken from one bad prison to the very worst prison for women, and that was at uh, Ravensbrück in, Ger in Germany, and that was a women's prison. And there they were put into a barracks, and the only reason the guards wouldn't come into the barracks was because it was infested with fleas. But because it was infested with fleas, Corey was able to read the Bible to others each and every night, and many were saved. What seemed to be just the very worst situation God used. What situation are you in tonight that you need to be delivered from? God is waiting. You just have to call on Jesus. <laughs>